Okay, I think we are going to move into our final um, panel and um, thank you all for being such a wonderful audience. That was a truly um, remarkable last panel and I think that the comments that Dean Engel closed with around the important role of government, including our government, on policies that impact people around the world is a, a really critical one. Um, on that note, I am very pleased to be able to um, introduce the former Prime Minister of Kenya, who will talk about the role of his government and health and more broadly some lessons. And I think we've talked a lot in this around, um, as, as uh, B has mentioned and others have said it in different ways, that golden triangle, the importance of having business and um, the NGO and civil society sector. But the role of government, as many people has mentioned, is also so critical uh, because of the huge role it plays in providing basic services to its population uh, having policy frameworks that make a difference and really set the foundation for so much of the kinds of work that we're, we're talking about. So um, it is my pleasure and honor to, uh, for the next uh, 20, 30 minutes, to have a conversation with um, the former pri Prime Minister of the Republic of Uganda, the Right Honorable Raila Odinga. And uh, what did I say? Oh, well, somebody just talked about Uganda. Sorry. Um, we, we, we've talked about, yes, anyway, what country am I talking about? Kenya, sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, who is currently um, uh, finishing out his term with the president at the African Presidential Archives and Center um, that um, Ambassador Stith represents at Boston University. Um, he has talked to me about all the different universities and places that he's been speaking, and it's a real treasure and honor to have this opportunity for people uh, like um, Prime Minister Odinga to have the chance to step back and reflect on um, his experiences and then be able to share those experiences with the world. As you know, he is currently the leader of the opposition coalition known as the Coalition for Reforms and Democracy in Kenya. Um, first elected to parliament in 1992, he served as Ministry of Energy and as Minister of Roads, Public Works, and Housing. Um, he was the main opposition candidate in 2007 presidential elections following, as we know, a very violent post-electoral um, crisis, and then took office as the Prime Minister in April 2008 and really, I think, um, in many ways set an incredible uh, example as he supervised a national unity coalition government. He holds a Master's of Science in Mechanical Engineering. He's married to um, Ida Odinga, who we had the pleasure of having dinner with last evening. Uh, they have... Oh, and she's there. <laughs> our friend <laughs> uh, Mrs. Odinga, and they have uh, four children, two boys, one girl, so hes uh, they've been in the middle of this discussion we've had about empowering girls, but also including boys uh, and men in the process. So we're going to have a conversation and talk about some of the different themes that we've touched on um, over the last uh, day. So and I'm going to come and sit down from here. And I, I, um, I guess I'll start with kind of a general uh, question. We've talked about a range of things that are both challenges as well as opportunities to better health in Africa. And from where you sat as Prime Minister of Kenya, I know that you put a high priority on health, but say something about what you also saw as some of the impediments. What were some of the challenges to improving health as you saw it um, in Kenya, and now as you've had an opportunity to think about it more broadly for the continent of Africa? Well, uh, I, mean, I would say that, thank you very much, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, it was a really learning experience listening to people talking about this issue of health. Now, the, this issue is actually not, we cannot talk about Kenya, Africa, and the universal. Um, as you know, Africa is coming from the background of colonialism. And during the struggle for colonialism, they were saying that we want to get rid of foreign rule so that um, we can be able to govern ourselves, to 
confront the three major enemies which were identified as ignorance, poverty, and disease. Um, 50 years down the road, some of those enemies are still there. Some of them are even stronger today. I think this, the fourth enemy that they forgot is bad governance. Uh, and without addressing the issue of governance, you cannot really deal with these other three enemies. So I think that is the reason why uh, we have not been able uh, to confront this enemy that is called a disease in, in, in Africa. Uh, because first, uh, there were lack of proper priorities in planning, and then there was also misdirection of resources. But third, there's also misappropriation of resources as a result of this uh, bad governance, what you call corruption. Uh, that characterized particularly the first 30 years of independence in most of African countries, what we call the wasted years. But from 90s, 1990 coming up, uh, there have been marked changes. That's why you can see that um, now, uh, now a number of African countries are registering fast growth. As Ambassador Steve said earlier on, tr it's trending in the right direction. The challenges that uh, we faced when we came into the office, of course, was um, we found inherited a very uh, sorry state of, uh, of affairs, um, uh, taking over from a regime which has been in power for 40 years. So we then came up with um, uh, a policy uh, which we call Vision 2030. Vision 2030 is aimed at transforming the economy from a struggling third world economy to a middle income economy by the year 2030. And it's anchored on three pillars, economic, social, and political. So the health uh, sector uh, fall, falls within the social uh, pillar of the Vision 2030. And here um, we say that we will uh, deal with issues of um, uh, uh, this health in a comprehensive manner, um, more particularly from a preventive point of view rather than curative. And that's the reason why the session just before us here was very um, interesting to me, because they are talking about food uh, production, because that is very critical uh, in uh, health provision, because a, a number of diseases actually are food related. Um, we uh, found uh, um, that the infrastructure uh, for Medicare in the country itself had been either neglected or was very thin on the ground. Um, in terms of physical infrastructure, and also in terms of uh, personnel, uh, the ground. Now, we then now address the issue of policy, um, which was comprehensively addressed, how we want to go about it, what are the resources. Um, uh, so I want, want to say that this, this period when I was there, we were able to make well, a number of changes um, uh, in, 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 in Medicare, but the challenges still remain. Okay. So, you know, one of the themes that's come out over and over again is this whole notion of um, local ownership versus um, external priorities. And, you know, those of us who uh, have been in global organizations you know, we set priorities, we talk about where resources, are, what, what some of the big global health challenges are, we um, appropriate money against the things that we think are the big global diseases, yet and still those don't always coincide with what the priorities at the country level are. What has been your experience, you're a country that had a lot of PEPFAR dollars, for instance, um, and, you know, and, and monies for, for a variety of different, very vertical health programs. How does that impact the ability for you to set priorities at the country level 
And what would you say to those of us who are trying to do the best we can um, as outside institutions providing support and assistance, what's this balance between global priorities versus uh, health priorities at the national and local level? Thank you. The, the, you see, they say that it is the wearer of the shoe who knows where the shoe pinches. <laughs> uh, and that's the reason why one size fits all uh, cannot do, and that has not done. That, in my view, is actually the cause of the problem. Uh, that is need first to diagnose the problem. As you know, that health challenges um, in Africa and in Kenya have been changing. Um, uh, in the past, we were dealing purely with, uh, mainly with communicable diseases, um, uh, malaria, um, HIV, AIDS, uh, and so on. Uh, but this has also changed because now we have got these chronic uh, diseases which have come in, uh, what we call the uh, civilization-born diseases. Um, here, like uh, diabetes, um, um, uh, heart diseases, uh, cancer, and so on and so forth. So this has also come now into the mix that also uh, need to, uh, to be addressed. Uh, in my view, this actually forms a very good partner, uh, I mean, uh, basis for a public-private uh, partnership. It is all already been recognized long before that public sector uh, funding alone is completely inadequate to provide um, um, uh, Medicare in the, in the, the country. But the conditions need to be uh, created. It should help to attract the private sector to come and become a partner mm -hmm. together with NGOs in um, healthcare uh, provision. Because we have seen that uh, when the two work in, in, in tandem, then the service provision uh, becomes more uh, efficient in, in our society. And that is the reason why we are addressing this issue. We have been addressing the issue of uh, access to Medicare. Um, uh, which, which is very, very important. That, uh, and we, we found that um, a, a number of people uh, are not able to access Medicare, uh, uh, even if it's accessible and it, it's not affordable. So accessibility and affordability is a, a major issue here. Um, countries which um, have addressed this have fared much better. Uh, my view is that uh, you need uh, um, a comprehensive uh, social health insurance uh, scheme to make the, the health care um, accessible uh, to the population. Say a little bit about the, your, in, your um, approaches to that, to insurance, financing health, and access to health, because I think uh, Kenya has actually done some pretty... Um, forward-thinking work in that, in that arena? You see, we have had um, um, challenges very similar to the Obamacare uh, <laughs> in this country. Uh, because as you know, it was first, uh, the first attempt was um, over five years ago, actually seven years ago, when it went uh, through parliament, uh, approved, but then the president, under pressure, refused to sign it into law and uh, send it back to, to, to parliament. Uh, there's the big business which are actually resisting because uh, we are introducing a comprehensive care where everybody else who is uh, working makes a contribution. The employer also makes a contribution so that the people who are not employed or the old, the infirm, can also can benefit from, from the, this scheme and that this would be rolled out, paid in those days through uh, a local government. Um, uh, but that did not go through. What has now gone through is uh, the one which is uh, selective, the civil servants, uh, the police, the military, and so on, have been included in uh, this scheme, which they call uh, the phase one. Uh, but they're saying that uh, 
the intent to roll it out uh, in the future. Uh, so we still have this problem of accessibility and affordability uh, by a large section of, of society, particularly when you are talking in terms of uh, areas where the extreme poverty does exist in our society today. Maybe given um, our president's Kenyan roots, we could call your um, legislation Obamacare as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, one of the other things that Kenya has really been, uh, I think, trying to focus on more is this whole issue of decentralization of health and health services. And you know, I think uh, in many countries there's been a lot of focus on how to make sure that, it, that in trying to have national standards that, it do, that the uh, health services don't stay so centralized that they don't actually get out and um, get rele be become relevant for the local communities. I know you had a lot to do with thinking about the whole um, approach to decentralization of the health s systems. Could you give people a little bit of a flavor for why you thought that was so important, how that's evolved, and what are some of the lessons that we might learn about how to be better about this balance between centralized standards and policies, but at the same time, much more decentralized impl uh, implementation? Well, yes, you see, um, we are coming, we are coming out from uh, a highly centralized uh, system of governance. And um, after a very careful study, we realized that our centralization was a major impediment to service provision. Why? Because there's a, a lot of bureaucracy. If, for example, in terms of health provision, uh, all the decisions in terms of policy and execution were all centered at the, 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 the national headquarters. Uh, so you find that people in the field have to wait for instructions to come from, from, from the, the center. Procurement of essential supplies is also centralized. And then you find also that recruitment and transfer of essential staff is also centralized. Sometimes you find that uh, pays of nurses in a, in a health center have, have, have not come. The nurse has to travel all the way to Nairobi to go and look for her pay. Um, so because of this, the, the, distrib the, the distribution of essential uh, um, uh, equipment and supplies also was very inefficient. Uh, we find that you have a health center, there are doctors, there are nurses, but they don't have drugs. There's a shortage of drugs. So you find people going there, they will be diagnosed, then there will be a prescription written for them, they have to go look for uh, drugs elsewhere because there's no supply. Um, so we decided that we decentralized. This was just with respect to, to health. But um, it's applied to several others. That's why when we were discussing our new constitution, we decided uh, to devolve uh, certain services uh, to the counties. So we now have 47 counties, each led by a governor, with a government, with an executive. Like there now, you have got uh, an officer or a, uh, an executive officer who is in charge of health. Uh, and they have got a, a budget, and they can do procurement. Or the national government procures, it is kept in the store, but then they themselves have to buy from the, 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 the national government, as and when they want, and, and then get supplies immediately. If they don't have the in store, then they are allowed to buy from elsewhere. Uh, uh, now the national government is now only charged with the policy. Um, to ensure that there's a uniform national policy on health, which is deals with. But um, the provision of services up to the uh, county hostels, or to use the district hostels, is the, under the jurisdiction of the county government. The national government deals with the referral uh, hostels, 
the national toll, the big tolls in the big centers, are the ones which are being managed by the, the national government. And um, the experience after one year is, is actually fairly positive. The challenge was only during the transition, transferring the services, uh, like in terms of employment, of the staff from the national government to the county government. But that has actually run out uh, very smoothly. Now here, the decision making is local. The communities are able to participate in decision making uh, here. Uh, it's, it, therefore, it makes the service much more efficient and responsive to the needs of the people in the county. Mm -hmm. Workforce is an issue, again, that has come up several times. And you know the challenges of having enough um, community health workers, nurses, physicians, and having them where they need to be in the right places in the system. It's another area that I know you put a lot of focus on, trying to look at this whole issue of uh, adequate workforce, brain drain, how do we keep um, good people working in the different, in the different um, pieces in the health system. What were some of the challenges that you faced in the issue of health workforce, and what were some of the ways in which you tried to work with that uh, to make sure that there were adequate uh, health, uh, health staff um, in the right places? Well, uh, the challenge has been um, uh, twofold. One is the existence of greener pastures outside the country, and the other one is um, opportunities for advancement in the profession, medical profession. When the, uh, in the old system, of course, the doctors, when they graduated, for example, would go and join the government as um, uh, interns. And then they have an opportunity to serve and then still go to the university and uh, then uh, uh, continue their studies. But then they are in the payroll of the government, so they are being paid uh, when they are away. Now the problem was that, of course, now they were going to be employed by the county government. And uh, the, uh, uh, the transition document was silent about this um, um, arrangement. So the doctors actually threatened not to go to transfer their services to the county government. Uh, but this matter has been discussed now and has been, been resolved. The other one is the issue of, of nurses. Uh, here you see nurses uh, have a, a lot of, are in demand. Um, like here, when I come to the United States, um, I meet very many nurses from Kenya, <laughs> who are new. Um, because uh, the biggest hospital in Kenya was my constituency. So these were my voters. I find them here, <laughs> I find them in the UK, some of them I find in Australia, in Canada, in uh, South Africa. They are all over the place because um, they are getting better, better pay. Uh, we, are con we have institutions that do t training of nurses, the colleges. But as much as they produce, you can say that about one third of them uh, vote with their feet uh, to greener pastures. So this is a uh, something that um, we still have no answer to, uh, that we are training um, uh, labor for other markets other than our own. So um, we've talked about the importance and the, uh, of investing in health uh, and for countries themselves to make greater investments in health. And um, earlier people talked about the fact that um, our, our development dollars are plateauing or um, you know, decreasing over time, and that if we're going to continue to have um, a real focus on health, it does mean that governments themselves are going to need to do more investment. But we also know that health ends up all, um, being underfunded and oftentimes is the, one of the weaker ministries within a government. What would you say is needed to make sure that um, governments in Africa, and not exclusively to, to Africa, but since that's what our focus is, what would you say is um, what we need to, what 
you and your colleagues, how do you get this higher on the agenda? How do you make health a higher priority? What are the arguments that you make when you're talking to um, your colleagues who are heads of governments around uh, in Africa to really get this on the priority list, get the kind of resources and the kind of commitment that's necessary? Well, as you know, that each and every country has got their priorities. But I think that, uh, by and large, the programs for development on the continent are almost the same, similar. Now, to be able to do this, you require a healthy manpower. Manpower development is very critical in this. Um, and you can, to have a healthy manpower, you need uh, Medicare, efficient medical, uh, medical system. Uh, you need also to invest in other areas, as I said. Because remember, um, John talked here about um, sustainable, inclusive development. See, sustainable, inclusive development is, is very, very, very crucial. Now, how does it become inclusive? You have address the issue of uh, income dis distribution within the society so that um, you don't have people who are so poor that they can they sleep without having uh, anything to eat. Because if you reach that level, then of course um, you have serious health challenges in the society. Uh, that's why I told you that we are laying emphasis on preventive as opposed to curative um, um, healthcare system. Um, we uh, would like to devote more. In fact, in our Vision 2030, we had say that we will uh, allocate at least 15% of the budget, this is budget to, to healthcare. Uh, and our Minister for Health has really <coughs> made a plea <coughs> For this, but there are always competing interests. There are other um, infrastructure, for example, areas of road construction, railway construction, uh, water, which, which is part of it, healthcare, uh, agriculture is part of it, uh, and um, education, which are all the time also competing for, uh, for attention. And as you know that sometimes there are a lot of political pressures. Uh, a minister promised during the last campaign that he was going to bring a road, do a road to the constituency. So that is what the minister will be looking for first. But the government, the top leadership of the government is where to drive it. In my own situation, I was leading um, a coalition government. So coalitions are not the easiest to manage, <laughs> as you know, because they are competing interests. They all the times need for compromises. So you don't have ideal situations. But um, based on my own, my advice to the African government would be that much as the other areas are priority, I think health should rank among the top priorities in the budgeting process. What percent of uh, government um, budget do you think should go to health? I would, I would think more than 15 percent, but um, uh, I'm thinking that minimum uh, 15 percent should go to health. I think that would be reasonable. So I'm going to ask you one question and then give you just an opportunity to talk about any takeaways from you having had the chance to be part of this incredible um, event today. First question, um, if you were back in office um, and you were thinking about what would you do that you think could have the greatest impact on health, what are the one, two, or th three things that you would do and then just your general reflections? I would, uh, uh, as I already mentioned already, uh, lay a lot of emphasis on preventive healthcare system. I would address the issue of access to clean water uh, throughout the country, that every household has got access to clean drinking water. Uh, 
Two, I would address the issue of food security in the country. Ensure that the country becomes self-sufficient in food. Uh, uh, in food. Um, then I would address the issue of um, maternal and uh, child, 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 child care. Because as you know that um, uh, first, uh, the, the, if the mother does not have good food, uh, the child will have a problem. Uh, we'll address this issue to ensure that uh, the child has, um, when it's born, is born healthy, and then you have got what they call the 1,000 day corridor, mm -hmm. where the child gets a proper nutritious uh, food uh, to grow and, uh, and be, be become healthy. And then um, d deal with issues like uh, education, access to education, and shelter. These are issues which are very critical to a healthy population. So these are the issues, and, and address the issue of infrastructure, health infrastructure in the country, to ensure that um, every, every citizen has got access to health care, accessible accessibility and affordability of health care, in my view, is very, very important to a government that is serious about development generally. Mm -hmm. Any other closing comments to leave with this audience before we end? Yes, I need to. Uh, I've been talking here about the uh, African lion. But you see, when we were talking here today, like, it gets the impression that some people think of Africa almost like uh, the elephant. Remember those? The, blind people who went to look for the elephant. Someone touched the task <laughs> and found it is very smooth uh, and, and long. The other one touched the leg, it is very rough. The ear, it is very flat. Uh, the um, uh, trunk, it is a pipe. And so on. So I say all of them were right, because all of them were the, 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 the elephant. This is, we must have a comprehensive, sustainable growth generally you know, in the continent. It's very important. So I'm saying, I'm talking about the African lion, the awakening African lion. And that's why what was said here earlier on was important, that the trend is in the right direction, that Africa is awakening. It's not an Africa of yesterday. Today, the 10 fastest growing economies in the world. Out of those 10, six are African. And as um, Charles said, some of them are growing double digits today. So Africa is an area which is very uh, uh, conducive today for investment. The return on investment in Africa is higher than any other part of the world today. And uh, there must be some uh, flashpoints. You can you talk about Boko Haram in Nigeria, problems in Mali, in Central African Republic, in South Sudan, in Somalia. Those are less than 10 out of 54 countries. By and large, the majority of countries in the continent are stable and are moving in the right direction. They are those who are leaders because the entire continent is in transition. And those who are leaders, that those who are following immediately, that those who are behind are being dragged together. But the African lion is here. And the African lion is saying this, that I am the African lion. I've been asleep in the Congo forest for too long. But now I'm awake. <laughs> it is telling the ancient tiger that you have danced alone on the stage for far too long. But now I have come on the stage. <laughs> the European bear retreated into the poles a long time ago. Now I am here and I am uh, bounded by the mighty Nile on the east, the Congo in the middle, the Gambia in the west, and Niger, the Limpopo in the south, and the Zambezi. 
bounded by the Atlas Mountains and Kilimanjaro. And I'm sitting on African diamonds, African gold, African copper, African bauxite, African iron ore, and African oil. I have the African people with me. And I'm going to ensure that my cubs eat properly, <laughs> that they know where to hunt, and that I am being able to transform the lives of all my cubs as an African lion. This is the message coming from the African lion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs>
and Wayne is going to be stepping down as his uh, in the position as president of the World Affairs Council of Atlanta. It's going to be hard to fill his shoes, but on behalf of Steve and myself, um, Cedric uh, Sussman and the, and the team at uh, the World Affairs Council, and all of you in this room, we just want to again thank Wayne for his incredible leadership. We will miss you. You have been a real uh, important colleague, friend, and brother. But uh, what you have started will continue to go on. So thank you so much, and thank you all. And we have 45 minutes reserved for networking, because the other part of this is for people getting an opportunity to get to know each other so that what started in this room doesn't end in this room. So I hope people will have the time to get to know each other. So thanks again.